how it works. <clears throat> All right, so uh, practical observable shared. So it's a very, you know, sort of like, it's not exactly, we're not gonna be talking exactly about like pure referential, you know, uh, referentially transparent functional programming. We're gonna be violating referential transparency, but not in a, in a guarded way, obviously, you know, like IO monad and so on. So in the end, you know, since everything's gonna be guarded by IO monad, it's gonna be referentially transparent, but there are gonna be some caveats, uh, as you will see. And, uh, but the basic problem that we're trying to solve here is that often you have DSLs that represent a certain, like a graph rather than a tree, right? So for example, you could have, uh, in, in this example, right? You have sort of like a context-free grammar and uh, number non-terminal refers back to itself, right? So, um, you know, we have digits, either zero or one, and we have numbers which are either um, like an empty sequence, so, you know, an epsilon, um, like an empty string, or a sequence of a digit and a number. And, you know, it's all works out fine as long as you just need to process this DSL in some way um, and say consume an input. Like, as long as you do not need to observe the fact that you actually have uh, parts of that DSL that refer back to itself, you're totally fine. And so, you know, you can write a parser, or in this particular case, it's more like a matcher, uh, and it works fine. But then, what if we, um, what if we want to produce the corresponding EBNF? Let's say that we want to, you know, we, we wrote our parser, and now we want to um, print it out. Or we want to produce a, like a bison or happy or whatever grammar so that we can use a, a better tool rather than parser combinator. So, well, I guess parser combinators are really good, but still, you might want to do something like um, something different with, with it, right? Or do some sort of analysis. And the problem is that um, because of referential transparency, we, we cannot really detect those references going back to, um, to our expression. So above where, uh, you know, we have this non-terminal N, in, it refers to itself, but because of referential transparency, we're not gonna be able to see the fact that it refers to itself, but rather we're gonna see um, basically as if there is a copy of itself inside of it and so on, right? So in, in reality, what the organ see is like uh, epsilon or D digit followed by epsilon or digit followed by epsilon or digit and so on. Um, and so a recursive structure like this, except with a lot more nesting, I just removed some and simplified the whole thing. Um, and so essentially like an infinite tree. But that's not very, we cannot really print it out, right? Uh, and we cannot detect the fact that some parts of it are actually shared. So we cannot see that, you know, uh, we, we cannot see those self-references, right? Uh, a different example is where we have circuits. And so, um, you know, we have latches, which basically means just a, a delay of one. Uh, we have uh, uh, different gates like XOR or AND. We have uh, inversion of a signal, right? So, or negation, I guess. And we can define all sorts of circuits like this. Uh, we can, you know, come up with our own hardware description language in Haskell, right? And we can use uh, higher order functions to construct those circuits. But if at the end of the day, we don't just want to run those things, but also 
to somehow dump them out as, say, VHDL or uh, Verilog, we won't be able to because of referential transparency, once again. Right, so it's fairly uh, you know, simple to run those. And basically, the idea is that uh, we represent signals as infinite, uh, as infinite sequences of booleans, right? And we, uh, if we have a latch, it's basically we start with a false, with false, and then we evaluate whatever is passed to the latch, right? And then if we have a XOR, we basically apply XOR to both components. And because of Haskell laziness, as long as we, we don't have a, uh, as long as we don't have like some uh, like direct loops, basically, as long as uh, a signal doesn't refer to itself directly, but rather it goes through a latch, uh, things are just going to work out and everything is going to run. And uh, a different example, you know, imagine that you want to write a you have some sort of like graph uh, search um, or it's a graph database and you want a nice um, DSL for searching subgraphs in that, in that database, right? Um, so for example, I don't know, you might want to search for some sort of like a, a person who is connected to some other person who is connected to some other person in a certain way, right? And uh, now, the problem is that like, you can definitely come up with indices here. You, know, like, you can represent graphs as uh, adjacency lists. You can represent graphs as uh, you know, all, all sorts of ways. Right? However, it's all very unsatisfying because you have to come up with names. Names generally do not compose. You have to you know, like spend extra time thinking about like how do you name things? Wouldn't it be so much nicer if you could just write Z, right? Of course, uh, if you look at it, it doesn't type check, but we'll fix that later. So the question is like, how do we violate referential transparency, but in a tasteful way so that we, <laughs> We violate it, but we don't, you know, <laughs> break things all over the place. Or say we violate it, but in a guarded way, meaning that, you know, um, we're going to do it inside of IO Monad, where, you know, such things are allowed. Well, one way we could do that is to basically um, introduce a new combinator fix, which takes a function that goes from a context for, you know, in our context for grammar example, we could take a function that takes a context for grammar and returns a context for grammar. And then we could pass it a magic number for each variable. When we convert it into a graph, we could pass it a magic number for each variable. Uh, and then, you know, as soon, and then traverse the resulting context for grammar, find any of those magic numbers and then convert that into uh, a graph. Obviously, that's horrifying. And uh, I would not recommend anybody do that. But it, it is possible. And you know, um, that's one, one design point. Um, <clears throat> we could provide an explicit node label for every single node. Uh, but the problem is that mm, like names do not compose in, in the sense that uh, you have to, if you have a large program and you have two separate graphs, you have to make sure that labels do not uh, intersect, right? And furthermore, um, well, I guess bug prone is precisely because it, this doesn't compose. And also it's very, it, it's sort of like, it's an extra burden on the developer to come up with names. And if you think about it, you already have all of the, all of the names, right? You have number there. It says number. So we do have a name, uh, but we, we cannot like use that name because of referential transparency. 
Now, there is a different solution uh, to this problem, which is called uh, monad fix, and we'll look at, at an example of this. Um, the reason it's not, it's, it sort of like satisfies all of our criteria, it works really well, and it's very predictable. The problem is that it has some, it sort of like add, adds an extra syntax on top of our um, expressions. Um, and it doesn't work in non-lazy languages. But we'll talk about it a little bit later. So one way we could achieve <laughs> You know, we could just directly violate referential transparency like some languages do, you know, uh, pretty much every language except Haskell, let's say, or except purely functional languages. We could just introduce refer um, comparison by reference, right? But obviously that is not very good because, uh, I mean, it works, but on the other hand, we sort of like break the fabric of our universe completely, right? Because, um, it, it's just so hard to reason about. Um, another way we could do that, in, in Haskell there is a thing called stable name. So every single object, um, well, GHC, GHC's runtime keeps uh, like a large table of stable names for every object and garbage collector, whenever it moves an object, it updates the references of the object in that table. And so you can actually create a so-called stable name for an object. And then those stable names have uh, a comparison operator, so they have an eek instance. And furthermore, they uh, can be hashed, although for some reason it doesn't, uh, like GHC doesn't expose hashable instance, so you have to write it yourself. Uh, and the problem with this particular function is that even though it allows us to compare things by reference and uh, it allows it to, uh, us to do it safely in the sense that it, it doesn't violate referential transparency uh, because there are no guarantees on what IO does, right? So even if we sometimes return true, sometimes return false, you know, uh, perhaps like we substitute, using referential transparency we substitute um, say we, we compare x to x, and then we substitute the value of x instead of uh, one of the arguments. Uh, it might return a different result, but that doesn't matter because it's under IO, right? Which means that it's allowed to return whatever it wants, basically. It could be a random number generator, and that would also be fine in some sense. Right, but the problem with this is that um, what we would really like to do is to be able to say uh, somehow you know reuse the existing machinery for our like let's say we want to make a map from like uh, we want to um, uh, create like a cache of uh, most recently used values of a function right in which case we want to be able to put our like references into a map. But the problem is that with this particular function, we cannot do that because uh, it doesn't satisfy, um, like if, even if you write uh, a wrapper around values of A, you cannot write an instance of EQ for that wrapper, right? Because EQ must, uh, implement like comparisons that takes a value of A, takes a value, another value of A, and returns a Boolean. It cannot return an IO of Boolean, right? However, what if we just used stable names directly? Um, except that, as I said, you might want to wrap them in an extra new type in order to provide, um, you know, hashable instance and to be able to use them in hash maps. So with this, we can actually use st standard data structures. We can put this stuff into a set. We can put this uh, into 
you know, we can use it as a key, uh, as keys in, in the map. And at the same time, we don't violate referential transparency because the act of taking a reference is actually guarded by IO. Um, now, as I said, uh, stable names are uh, sort of like GHG's uh, feature. Uh, however, they can be implemented in every other language that I know of, uh, as long as they have weak maps. And uh, so uh, later I will show you how to implement them in PureScript. And uh, in, in Scala, it's basically just, you can just new type a, a reference and just use that. Right, because uh, in Scala you, you have referential uh, comparison. And unfortunately, in, in Haskell, uh, stable names cannot be compared by, uh, they cannot be, you cannot create an uh, order instance for, for them because uh, hashes are not guaranteed to be unique and you need some sort of information about uh, in order to create an ORD instance, right, you need some way to um, like compare them, but since hashes are not guaranteed to be unique, and that's the only thing that we get out of stable names, we cannot really come up with an ORD instance. So, but you can still use hash, name, uh, hash maps and hash sets. Now, so far we've talked only about how to observe uh, uh, how, how to observe whether two references are the same, right? But that's only like half of the entire story, right? Because um, in every particular case, sure, you know, you can, you can write your own, let's say uh, if you want to work with uh, context-free grammars, you can write your own uh, graph traversal and, you know, like go through the context-free grammar, find all the references, compare them, and so on. But we would like to do that for every single data structure out there. Because, uh, you know, as programmers, we're sort of lazy and want to generalize everything. So, let's look at this example, first of all. Um, now, I separated my definition of clock into two separate uh, statements, right? I have a, an anonymous node that inverts a clock, and they have another one that, uh, oh, an, an anonymous node that uh, delays the clock, and the uh, clock itself is defined as, a, as a, the negation of that, of that node, right? So I have this structure down below. Now, is everybody familiar with uh, the adjacency list representation of graphs, right? No? Okay, we'll see how it looks like. So, one potential representation for graphs is that for every single node, you have a list of uh, nodes that it is connected to, and it's called an adjacency list, right? So, for example, here we have a, this, this doesn't type check, quite type check, but we'll fix that in a moment. But here we have a representation, so we have zero, first node, that, that corresponds to our anonymous nodes. It is connected to uh, the first node, and the first node is connected to the zeroth node. Now, notice that uh, normally you're dealing with untyped graphs, meaning that every, it's sort of like you can just represent them as a, as a map from integer to list of integers, because uh, there, it doesn't matter like your connections do not have a sort of like meaning. They're all the same, right? But in this particular case, all of our connections have different meanings. Because for example, if we have, uh, if we had something like, uh, you know, XOR can only have two, can be connected only to two other nodes. And, uh, and latch just can only be connected to one. And if, if, if we had any, say, non-symmetric operators, like implication, then the order of those connections would matter as well, right? And so this is, uh, 
what I call uh, like typed adjacent list representation of graphs. Uh, and the idea is that this is kind of like the natural representation for um, recursive and potentially self-referential uh, but well-typed data structures. So in order to fix, like, as I said on the previous slide, uh, the previous slide didn't quite type check because the latch doesn't take an integer as, a, as an argument. It takes like another signal as an argument, right? So we have to fix that, first of all. Surprisingly, like if you are familiar with the recursion schemes, you might realize that, hey, you know, like this looks very much like a recursion, uh, you know, like a pattern functor in recursion schemes, right? And so the idea is that we're gonna come up with a new ADT that can hold both uh, signals inside of it and integers if we want to. And it sort of like represents a single layer of our data structure, if you think about it. And now we can type check our graph. Now, that new data structure that we just introduced uh, is actually called like pattern functor or signature functor. And the idea is that if you have an arbitrary tree, it's just one layer of that tree. So imagine that if you have a tree, um, the top node is connected to some you know, more trees, and you're just extracting one layer of that. And uh, you, know, you can implement project and embed for uh, every time you have like a signature functor, you should be able to implement both project and embed. And basically the idea is that project like ex extracts one layer off the top of your structure and the embed uh, takes one layer with trees inside of it and makes a tree. Right? And in fact, in Haskell and you know, PureScript and everywhere, uh, everywhere else, you can just use standard type classes called uh, recursive and co-recursive. Now, the reason, uh, as far as I know, in, in Haskell, it doesn't really, you can implement both for pretty much every type, uh, for re every recursive type. Um, however, there are some there are some slight differences with respect to uh, like laziness and uh, whether you can, whether you allow infinite structures or not. Uh, but that doesn't matter for us in, in our case. And so if we want to, uh, if, we, if we have our signal, now we can project and create, uh, like extract a single layer out of it, right? All right, now let's talk about like graph traversal algorithms. Um, usually what you do, like when, if you want to traverse a graph, right, you have either a queue or a stack of nodes. You take the first node, then you uh, check if you visited it or not. If you haven't visited yet, then you find all of its children and you add them to the top of your queue or stack or you know, to the end of your QR stack. Depending on, like, depending on where you add them and depending on what kind of data structure you use, you get either uh, depth first traversal or breadth first uh, traversal, right? Now, we will be using DFS, so the algorithm changes a little bit, uh, or rather, you know, we can implement it differently, which is gonna be more suitable for uh, our purposes. But basically, we find a node, uh, and then we take a node, and then we, we check if we visited it or not. Uh, we find all of its children. If we haven't visited it, we find all of its children, and then we immediately recursively uh, uh, visit those. Right, and so <clears throat> in essence, we are using, instead of using a stack, <clears throat> we are using, uh, our like runtime stack to hold those references, 
and to, to sort of like have, uh, you know, we are, um, you can reify that stack as a stack, but you don't have to. <clears throat> and so in our case, nodes are signals, and we have a way to compare two signals together now, right? Um, we, we can compare them by reference. So that's taken care of. But we still have a slight problem where, you know, uh, when dealing with signals, it's fairly easy to go over all of its children, like of, a, of children of a particular node. But we want to generalize this pattern rather than uh, solve it for just one particular data structure. And so in the more general case, right, we have uh, some recursive type T uh, and we'll require a recursive uh, instance for it. And then when we want to traverse, or rather when we want to uh, find all of our children, we can just use project, right? And that, that's gonna like extract one layer off of, our, uh, off the top of our uh, structure Right, but the only problem is that we still need to somehow go over all of those children. Right? So we have like a single layer of subnodes, but we still need to, uh, you know, and it's going to be like FT, where F is uh, our pattern functor. But now we need to go over all of those, right? Well, how do we go over a data structure? We use either foldable or traversable. In this particular case, since we are going to be using I.O. Um, in, you know, for some other reasons, we would like to have like uh, monadic folds and we would like to be able to, like foldable would still work probably, but you would lose the, the structure, right? If you have anything inside of your structure, foldable doesn't allow you to like, uh, like fold over a data structure and, uh, but keep all of the information that was in that data structure, right? Whereas traversable allows it to do just that. Um, <clears throat> and so we can implement traversable for our pattern functor in this particular case. And in general, uh, I would be surprised if you could find a pattern functor that does not have a traversable instance. Uh, <clears throat> and so in some sense, I, I, I would honestly say that um, this is a pretty valid constraint on recursive. Like if you have something that does not implement traversable, that's a very weird data structure, right? Okay. Um, so, and now once we have extracted one layer, right, we can use traverse to go all, over all of its children. And then using traverse, we can also replace all of those uh, nodes with their identifiers, right? As we are sort of like traversing the graph, we would like to, we want to preserve the structure, which means that if you, if you remember our typed uh, adjacent to list representation of graphs, you remember that every single entry was a, uh, like a pattern functor of node IDs, right? And so the, the idea is going to be that we're going to be going over our graph, over our um, you know sub nodes, and we're going to be replacing them with IDs using traversable. <clears throat> and so this is our algorithm for. Uh, for this entire presentation, actually. Um, basically, the idea is that, okay, we have a recursive TF and traversable F. We take a node, we check if we visited it or not using our guarded referential, uh, reference uh, compare, you know, equality. <coughs> and then uh, if we, we haven't uh, visited that node, then we are gonna go over all of its children using combination of project and traverse. And so this is uh, sort of the end result of, uh, you know, this is like 
what do you get in the end if you implement this algorithm? And what's interesting is that actually you can go in both directions. Um, you can take your ADT or recursive data structure and you can convert it into graph representation. And then you can go back to uh, recursive uh, representation. And what's interesting is that like going back to recursive re uh, representation does not, you get the most optimal representation, you, you know. Uh, like basically is a map one to one and they map in such a way that you don't introduce extra garbage. You don't introduce like extra um, references going anywhere on the, or anything like that. Now, uh, the standard recursion schemes package uh, exposes a slightly different recursive and co-recursive uh, definitions, slightly different um, <clears throat> Definitions that uses type families instead of uh, functional dependencies, which means that recursive, uh, there is a type family base. So uh, type family base, which gives you this signature functor for any T. So base T is your signature functor. And so that's the only difference here. Uh, and that's uh, how you would write it in, uh, in Haskell. However, in PureScript, you actually have uh, a definition using functional dependencies. <laughs> and in Scala, I guess you would use some sort of, uh, you know, aux pattern or something like that. Oops. Well, now, in, in the original papers that introduced this idea, there is actually a paper. Uh, they used a sort of like a combination of recursive and uh, traversable, and they dropped a bunch of stuff from, from there. And so they have like a single operator called map DREF. Uh, unfortunately, it's not entirely visible, but basically what it does is that for map DREF, it's like it's a combination of project and traverse. So you project and, you, and then you immediately traverse. Um, and so that's. That's how I originally implemented it in Scala when I was uh, working on this project. But then later on I realized that uh, it's much more intuitive if you separate the two. Okay, now let's look at some source code. And uh, at some demos. But we'll come back to the presentation in a little bit. So there is a repository uh, Alex Kienville, Practical Observable Sharing Talk. Unfortunately, like, uh, the implementation of this stuff in different languages is slightly different. And furthermore, so there is no like mapping in between like PureScript and Haskell. Uh, in fact, in PureScript, I've only implemented the core algorithm and I, you know, left the rest for somebody else because PureScript doesn't quite have uh, lazy data structures. And so, which m makes all of this stuff a lot more annoying than in, say, Scala or uh, Haskell. In Scala, you can implement lazy data structures with some, uh, with a little bit of uh, extra work. Uh, <clears throat> and so, I'm gonna show you First, how, uh, how to implement it in uh, Haskell. Huh. Actually, let me see. Oh, and uh, I have some more uh, recent changes that I just pushed uh, into that repository, sorry. 
it kind of like changes uh, the whole structure of uh, this repository. So that's pretty important stuff. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, the implementation in Haskell first, and then in Perscript, and then we'll talk about Scala. Um, so in Haskell. Do I have a main? Which file? Oh, so this is uh, Haskell source reification. So this is our um, stable names, first of all. We have stable name uh, at the top. And uh, you can see that the reason I'm wrapping uh, stable name in a new type is because I want that uh, hash stable name thing uh, to be, yeah, I actually want an instance uh, of hashable. And then we have our graph representation over here. And then we have the main algorithm uh, for con you know, converting a, a data structure into a graph. Now, it's actually very simple, but the only problem here is that uh, the state is kind of complicated. Uh, and in fact, later on, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about monad fix, which could simplify this code a lot. But um, the idea is basically we keep three, uh, we keep, first of all, we keep the size, uh, the current like, size of our um, set that we've set of nodes that we've found so far, right? So basically size gives us uh, the next index, the next available index. And then we also have a, for every single element, we have a mapping from their, that element's reference to, to its ID, and we have a mapping from IDs to the actual like structure of it, right? The reason we have all three uh, of those things is because when we are traversing our graph, we first want to add a name to, we want to mark a node as visited first, then we want to go over all sub, sub nodes, produce an entry and add that as well to, to our uh, uh, state. So it's kind of like a, a two-step process. We first just add the name, we first mark it as a, as a visited node, then we go over all sub trees, and then we add the structure to, to our state, right? And, and you can see the structure of, you know, this um, traversal over here, basically. Um, it's, it's very simple. And in the opposite direction, so, you know, in the opposite direction, it's actually, <laughs> the code is technically partial. <laughs> However, the reason it's partial is because uh, whenever I produce graphs, uh, my zeros element, element always points at the root of my graph. And so, and I always know that there is at least one element. And that's why, you know, y you can obviously produce a total version of this using like maybe and so on, but it really doesn't hurt in this particular case because the only way I produce graphs is using two graph and that is going to guarantee that from graph also works. Now, oops. you know, in pure script, it's basically the same exact idea. Uh, there is almost no difference except that uh, you know the code the code looks a little bit more different because PureScript has its own uh, you know has certain weirdness to it and like certain things just uh, do not work uh, and you know like that was my first PureScript project and. Uh, I prefer Haskell. I can tell you that. Like errors are so much better in Haskell, and uh, you know, it's just it doesn't. PureScript normally fails on the first error, which is like 
doesn't make it very easy to, uh, to write code. But other than that, it's basically the same exact idea and the same exact data structures as well. However, in, in pure script, we don't have st stable names. And so, um, but it turns out that as long as you have weak maps, you can implement those. So basically over here, I have a package with uh, uh, like a foreign import implementation of stable names. And in JavaScript, I just keep a, a weak map of references. Uh, whenever somebody creates a stable name, I put an object into that weak uh, map and I assign an ID. And then I can compare those IDs um, and use uh, them as hashes as well. Okay, and uh, in Scala, as I said, uh, the implementation is uh, sort of like lacking or lagging rather uh, in terms of uh, the abstraction that is used. And so oops, let's paste. Um, and so here I'm actually using uh, this, the original abstraction from the paper. Um, if I were to rewrite it you know, now, I would definitely not use that. I would just use a recursive and, uh, and traversable. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so essentially, well, if you look at the signature, right? Um, you take some node, A, right? And for every sub node, so for every A that is contained in the original A, you produce some F of U, so some effect and also some uh, values that you want to substitute instead of that node. Uh, and then it returns back like this. Essentially, DREF is your uh, pattern functor. They just don't, you know, they just call it differently, right? DREF is your pattern functor. And so basically what this says is that it's, it's, it's like uh, you first project and then you traverse using that function. You project A above into a pattern functor, so you first convert it into DREF of A, and then you traverse it using your function, so you take every element and you uh, replace it with U and sequence all of the effects. So it's really not related to No, no. Well, it, it, it is related to fixed point types in the sense that it's related to recursion schemes. Mm -hmm. But uh, Name. no. I mean, maybe there is some sort of connection here, um, but I don't think so. <clears throat> okay. And so once we have that in Haskell and PureScript, um, So let's see how we can use it, right? So I have the same example we looked at uh, previously, you know, with the signal, but now I'm gonna end with the signal F as its pattern functor. And then in order to use all of this machinery, I need to, you know, add a couple more things here. I need my uh, base functor, or rather, you know, signature pattern functor, and I need my recursive and co-recursive instances. And as soon as I have those, and obviously uh, traversable, but that can be derived automatically in Haskell. So we don't really have to do anything ourselves here. As soon as we have all of those, um, you know, over here I have like some circuitry 
we can actually you know, use our to graph function in order to convert it into a graph, then print it out, then convert it back, and then run the final uh, circuit. And we, we can actually check, you know, like go in both directions and check that everything uh, works fine, right? And uh, let me show you that that's actually the case. Yes, one moment. Whoa. That's a lot of numbers. What is... <laughs> okay. So, in a, I had a fairly complicated uh, network, but if you read it with something simpler, you'll see that uh, it actually produces, uh, you know, a reasonable, reasonable uh, graph representation. But in this particular case, there are like seven nodes, uh, so it's a little bit uh, complicated. And then over here, I basically run the, the, I simulate that network directly, right? And then I simulate the same network, but after conversion back from the graph rep representation. And we can see that, of course, it works exactly the same because, uh, you know, it's the same network. And then, similarly, if you have a parser, and this is a lot more sort of applicable, in my opinion, but if you go uh, back here and into slides. It's here. Oh, no. In parsing uh, simple language. So I, ha I have this very sort of like s simplistic language for expressions uh, where I can have uh, literals. They can only be like sequences of zeros and ones. Uh, or I have addition, um, and I have addition and multiplication. And so, but all of my parsers are defined in a sort of final tagless form, you could say, or uh, you know, using a type class. Basically, they are abstracted over a particular parser representation. You can use it for any kind of parser uh, with any kind of parser. Right, uh, and this step drop one, uh, one three five, ignore it. But basically, because I'm using a, uh, a very limited uh, parser API, I have to do some nasty things, uh, right? Uh, if if it was a something, if it was a different type class, you would probably be able to, you know, like, uh, write parsers just as you would in say Mega Parsec or some, you know, any other uh, parser combinator or library. And so, what's cool about this is that I can uh, reinterpret my parsers in many different ways. So, for example, for here, I have uh, an expression parser, right? And I can parse an expression. So, I have uh, this so called simple parser, which is. Uh, Essentially, it's just the most simplest uh, parser combinator um, implementations that you can find. Right? It basically just takes a list of symbols and then it returns a list of uh, possible ways to parse it. Is everybody familiar with parser combinators? Okay. Just look them up on the internet. Oh, okay. Well, the idea is that, um, you know, normally when we write parsers in, like, using some external tool, right, we, we write a, like, a, there is a certain grammar, a certain, like, way of writing, like, a certain language for writing parsers, right? And uh, it turns out that uh, you can actually embed your parsers into your language, right, by 
essentially combining them together in, in certain ways. So, you know, like if you have, in, in Bison you have, say, uh, non-terminals and you can have uh, like either a sequence of n n uh, either one non-terminal or the other non-terminal. That's going to correspond to a single combinator in your uh, parser combinator library. And so, and, and basically here, Yes. Yes, that, that would be like a combinator for parsers. And basically, you know, I, I just needed a type class for parsers. So this is what I came up with. But the idea is that you either have a symbol, a single symbol, right? And that is going to produce a parser that uh, just takes just that symbol um, and fails if there is no such symbol at the, at the beginning of your stream. So it just checks whether there is a single symbol at the beginning of your stream. Then there is epsilon parser, which uh, always succeeds. And the idea is that it represents an empty string. There is uh, any, which succeeds as long as you have at least one character. Uh, alternative, which tries both. Uh, it has two arguments, and it tries both at the same time. And then if either, uh, well, it's a, like left uh, biased, but basically the idea is that it first tries the left parser, then the right parser. If the left one succeeds, then it returns that result. Otherwise, it returns the result of, of the right parser, right? Um, and then you have sequencing that's basically you first parse using the first parser as much as possible, right? And then you switch to the second parser and you parse the rest of the string. So, for example, if you wanted to parse two numbers, you would do like sequence of digit and another digit. Um, and then IMAP is basically just uh, mapping with, with an isomorphism. And uh, a rule is just to name parsers. It's basically the idea is that you, you have a name and you, you give it a name and a parser and it's going to create a new parser that is in some sense named with that name. The reason it's useful is because um, you know, for printing stuff out, essentially. And, and so I can take this one expression and reinterpret it in many different ways. So first, I just parse an expression and it's going to automatically uh, convert it. Well, it's just a parser, so it's just going to produce uh, a parse tree for that particular expression. And then, you know, I have some other examples, but they are not related to, uh, uh, to the current topic. But you can also take your parser and convert it into a context-free grammar. Assuming that, uh, you know, there are certain restrictions. Restrictions apply, let's just say, if you, uh, in in any parser combinator library, in principle, you could uh, construct a parser that is, uh, or rather, con construct a grammar that is not context free if you don't have any restrictions on how you build up your parsers. Um, and so, in which case, this is going to result in like uh, an infinite tree or an infinite grammar, essentially, an infinite context free grammar. Uh, we don't really want that because those are not going to be convertible into graph. And what's going to happen, is, remember we are working I.O. And basically, basically we're just not going to terminate. It's, a, it's as if we're going to be running in an infinite loop. And eventually we'll consume all of the memory and, and just die. But, uh, so you have to be a little bit careful about that kind of stuff because in, especially in in Haskell, it's very easy to construct infinite structures. Um, but, you know, like when writing parsers, uh, infinite structures take you from the nice land of like context free grammars to context sensitive grammars. So you might not want to do that. Anyway, you can reinterpret your parser as a context free grammar, and then you can convert that into a graph. And you get your uh, graph representation. 
Now, in Haskell, I do not have a, a good example where this is converted to uh, eBNF. However, I do in Scala. And so, in Scala, I have a, an even, you know, a slightly more complicated language where I have numbers, I have uh, identifiers, I have like uh, um, addition, multiplication, everything can be nicely nested and so on. And then I have my parser and you know since it's Scala it looks, might look a little bit weird to you and it doesn't really, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, and furthermore, you can see that IntelliJ is not able to handle my syntax. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, it's basically the same idea. I have I take an instance of like mm, parsing for some parser p, and then I, you know, use those the combinators from that um, object in order to construct my parsers. And then I go through the same process. I also, you know, I reify my context-free grammar, meaning that I convert it into graph representation. And then I print it as eBNF grammar. And let me zoom in. And here is the result. Now, anonymous nodes are introduced automatically. And uh, in, in principle, they could be pruned uh, because there is like you can do all sorts of, once you get a graph, obviously you can do all sorts of modifications to that graph, right? And this kind of represents the raw structure of my recursive, you know, the raw recursive structure, but you can do all sorts of modifications to it. And furthermore, you can turn it back into a context-free grammar again. So you can see that, uh, so even though I'm defining my grammar as just a, uh, you know, like a bunch of combinators, right? And with recursive references or self-references, right? I'm still able to convert it into uh, a nice looking graph. A, a nice looking, uh, a nice looking UBNF grammar, but, uh, right? But uh, also sort of like just name things. That's the idea right here that we are naming uh, different references. And now you can take this and you can use any other tools that, uh, you know, takes a, you know, you can, you can dump it out, you can do all sorts of things. You can optimize it. Like for example, over here, um, there are certain duplications, uh, although it might not be quite some easy to see. So, for example, here, from digit to uh, digit is like anonymous node 24, right? We don't really need that extra uh, indirection, right? We could, in principle, compress this graph. We could, uh, you know, inline things, and then we could take the resulting representation and convert it back to grammar that would be more efficient. And over here, I have a slightly different example where, you know, a larger example where I also allow spaces and, uh, you know, like my grammar becomes normalizing, meaning that spaces are normalized to uh, sort of like removed, extra spaces are removed. But that is still reflected in the grammar. And so I'm able to see that in, in my eBNF uh, representation. And another thing you can do, and I'm, I'm sort of like gonna lie to you a little bit uh, over here, but uh, you can also check whether your um, parser combinator, parsers satisfy or context for grammar satisfy certain properties, which are tricky to, to check if you have like an infinite uh, tree, 
right? If you have an infinite context-free grammar, uh, you know, like an, a representation as an infinite tree, uh, it's impossible to compute certain things on an infinite tree. Uh, because you might be always forcing the wrong, uh, you know, you might be going in the direction where you force things uh, and you, you just never, comp you, you never finish, you know, computing. Because you are just going, you know, you force a certain subnode, and then you discover that in order to compute the entire thing, you need to further force, you know, first uh, all of its children and so on. So you are just descending into the data structure and uh, you're na never able to actually return. Whereas if you have a graph representation, it's a lot easier because you know that there is only a finite number of nodes and so you, will, you are guaranteed to terminate. However, over here, uh, it's sort of like not exactly true, like the way I implemented it is not exactly right. Um, basically, I'm checking whether a graph is nullable by you know, recursively computing. Uh, yeah. What's it mean for a graph to be nullable? Um, basically, for a context-free grammar to be nullable, it means uh, that it accepts an empty string. Oh. So for example, over here, you see that epsilon is a uh, accepts an empty string, whereas uh, like mm, a particular symbol, if you, if you are, if your parser requires a particular symbol, then it it doesn't accept uh, an empty string. So that's just the property. Of yes. Um, here I define it recursively, but it, you have to uh, like if you were to, to implement it properly, you would actually need to uh, very carefully reason about like. Uh, how you compute how you compute this stuff because you actually want to essentially start with all nodes unknown, then make a single pass go through and find all like epsilon transition uh, you know epsilon nodes and all like non epsilon node mark those then go over again and um, find like all uh, sequencing operations and, uh, you know, alternation operations, and then compute as many as possible of those and do another pass, another pass. So basically, like, uh, find a fixed point of this algorithm, right? You, you, if you do the recursively like this, uh, I'm worried that you might actually run into the same problems as you, as you had with, uh, with graphs. But, uh, but it is still possible. And, uh, What's, what's interesting about it is that once you have that algorithm on graphs, you can actually run it on your parsers directly. Now this unsafe perform IO is actually safe because it it's, might not be obvious, but essentially um, the properties of grammars uh, do not change if you make any substitution substitutions, variable substitutions. Basically, equational substitutions where you substitute uh, equal parts of a, like if you have a grammar and you have some, uh, like, a subgrammar in it, it doesn't matter whether, like the properties do not change under substitution. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and so it, it doesn't really matter um, like refer the, the result of this operation is not going to depend, like no matter what kind of substitutions you make inside of your grammar, it's not going to change the result. And so that's why uh, unsafe perform IO here is, is okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let's go back to slides. So what sort of things can we do with this? Well, as I showed you, we can produce eBNF grammars for uh, you know, parsers, which is really nice because pretty much no library does that. Uh, however, in, you know, like we can turn recursive structures obviously into graphs uh, and back, uh, check like different properties, not just nullability, but other properties uh, of uh, infinite structures as well. Uh, you can, for example, 
check whether a structure is infinite, right? If you have a, somebody gives you a list, you can use this technique to check whether it's uh, infinite. However, you have to be careful because if GHC, by, for some reason, decides, uh, you know, like if you say you write Fibonacci numbers, right? Then you, you have to like, in, in order to observe that it's actually a self uh, recursive structure, you need to reify both uh, lists, but also like addition, because in Fibonacci we have, uh, we are adding elements together, right? So is everybody familiar how to implement like Fibonacci uh, numbers in Haskell using like infinite lists? I actually had to do that in order to work around uh, Haskell's optimizer well, I was writing, uh, oh, might be over here. Oh. Hmm. Oh. So I was trying to check my referential uh, equality, and I wrote one list, you know, list is uh, one. Uh, prepended to to the list, right? And wrote another one, which looks exactly the same way, right? It's uh, also uh, one prepended to list two. And uh, unfortunately, GHC immediately saw that those trees are exactly the same and optimized that, right? And so uh, when I was checking my referential equality, I, I, I was seeing, uh, you know, e e even though they look different, I mean, they have different names and they di look as if they have different structure, GHC actually can figure it out and like merge them together. And so the way you can avoid that is by inserting like a very complicated uh, instruction that GHC is not able to optimize, right? So in this particular case, let's say you can compute like Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> uh, but you can see that even though Fibonacci numbers uh, this infinite list of Fibonacci numbers is self-referential. Uh, it's actually like that uh, those references are going to be hidden away behind addition. And so uh, you won't be able to observe them. So all of your like self-references have to be properly embedded into um, like some sort of data structures. That's uh, one caveat. Oops. Now, <clears throat> I also implemented uh, this sort of like graph DSL, and I discovered that uh, there are some other issues with this uh, um, with this technique in specifically in Haskell, right? Other languages are pretty dumb and they do not like optimize stuff properly. Uh, whereas Haskell is a little bit, you know, it's too smart for its own good. And uh, so, and sometimes it like duplicates stuff, duplicates work uh, for, for whatever reason. So it's because it's pure and, you know, um, purely functional language, uh, all sorts of optimizations um, are allowed, right? And so, and, and, and GHC does all sorts of things to your code, right? And so it may like duplicate elements or deduplicate elements. And so we have to be careful that whatever you do, it better be uh, invariant to those duplication and deduplication of nodes. And so when I run this, I, I discovered that, oh look, there are supposed to be three nodes, right? But if we actually run it in GHC, you'll find that there are five different separate lists uh, or nodes there. But however, you can see that node five and node two are exactly the same, right? I mean, their contents are the same. They are, they are both nodes pointing at node three. So, you know, like we can, eliminate such duplication, and this can be done automatically as well, right? We find that uh, 
Node 5 and Node 2 are the same, so we merge them together. Then we merge nodes 4 and 1, and then finally 3 and 0, right? And in the end, we end up with a, like a graph representation that doesn't have any uh, unnecessary duplication. So that's exactly what we wanted. So this is sort of like, it, you know, it, it's a problem for if you're writing a DSL and you want to get exactly what you wrote, right? Uh, you might not get it because of uh, the things that GHC does under the hood. And, um, you know, in principle, the same exact approach can also work for uh, higher kind of uh, ADTs. So, for example, meaning that, you know, ADTs that take type parameters. So, for example, here we have like parsers. And in principle, you know, similarly to how we define, how we extract the recursive structure from uh, just a regular algebraic data type, the recursive algebraic data type, we can similarly extract the recursive uh, structure in this particular case. However, you know, we, it's just a little bit more complicated and we can get some, a little bit more, you know, type parameters. And we also need slightly different uh, type classes for all of this uh, to work. So we don't really have, like, uh, our graphs, uh, change in, in their shape and, and so on, like things uh, are a little bit more tricky. But there is nothing fundamentally uh, difficult about it. Now, in, I also have a, just one slide about monad fix. Now, monad fix is probably the correct solution uh, to this prob uh, to the problem of observ observable sharing if you really, really do not want any duplication or deduplication, right? If you really want the exact, um, like basically, if you are willing to, if you are willing to write a little bit more code and a little bit more sort of uh, ver uh, verbose versions of your of your code, then Monad Fix is probably the right solution here. Um, the idea of behind monad fix is that since Haskell is a lazy language, when you make a bind, so above, let's see, we have a bind A is some function of ABC, right? Uh, when you make a bind, you don't need to immediately compute the result, right? And so you can, yes, essentially what this does is that it produces three sunks Right, for A, B, and C, then when you compute your function, well, you don't compute them, but when you like, pass those to F, it actually passes those sunks, but they're not yet filled in. Then it runs the first, the first line, right? It computes A, but B and C at that point are not gonna be filled in yet. Then it runs the next line and so on, and it sort of like builds you, uh, allows you to build um, this recursive data structure while running a monadic computation. Yes, mind blown, right? So it's like fix, but the difference is that you compute one step at a time and they can be monadic. Um, and so, you know, like, when you run the first line, it's gonna, you know, like, sort of run F, but as long as, you're using B and C in such a way that you don't force them, it doesn't actually need the actual values, right? And so it can actually keep just the sunks without evaluating them. You compute A, right? Then you go to the next line and so on. Um, yeah, it's, some, it's crazy stuff. And the problem, but the problem is that without laziness, this just doesn't work, like at all. Um, now, you can, implemented in Scala using like eval and your own monad class. Uh, instead of uh, monad, you'll need something like lazy monad. Um, and in your binds, <laughs> in your binds, you will need a, you know, like normally a bind looks like, um, you know, in Scala, right? Flat map, 
and it takes a function from A to F of B. Well, in order to implement this, you would need a bind that looks like a flat map eval of A to, uh, to F of B, right? Uh, and this is actually enough to, to implement, uh, you know, using eval, you can actually implement uh, this kind of stuff in, in Scala, but, you know. Yes, and you would, so G, this is actually just uh, sugar, uh, in, in, G, in GHC this is just uh, like uh, sugar around um, an, oper an operation called mfix. Uh, and unfortunately, because in Scala we don't have any sugar, right, and you cannot have uh, forward references in a for comprehension, you would need to use this uh, like mfix directly, which is gonna make your code even worse looking, you know? So it's kind of like, um, it, it works in Haskell, but that's about it, right? And this is not gonna work in like pure script or any other uh, strict language without extra compiler support. And uh, I'm gonna show you that this is uh, still, you know, a viable approach to this problem. Not entirely sure if I, uh, you know, implemented everything uh, sort of like in, an, in a very idiomatic way uh, because, uh, well, it's kind of like, I feel like it's a little bit tricky to reason about mfix as well. Uh, but the idea is that basically I have uh, my signals, but I'm, but this time I'm gonna also keep for every single signal, I'm also gonna keep an ID that I'm gonna like assign as soon as I create those, right? So my latch uh, A is gonna be, let's say an integer, in which case, uh, a latch is gonna contain a reference to another signal and an integer ID. And then I can identify my signals or basically get their identifier using this function. And you know, like if you look at this, you, like if, you, if you're used to recursion schemes, you might realize that this can be written as a like env, uh, like as a, fixed point uh, signal can be written as a fixed point of n of t uh, of the identifier and uh, the pattern functor, right? So, you know, like maybe if you use the recursion schemes, this is gonna be even kind of like nicer looking and won't require an extra type parameter. But basically, you know, in order to, since now we're gonna be working in, a, in some monad, Right? And we're gonna be creating those uh, indices as soon as possible. We need, uh, you know, one way to do that is to work in state monad, right? And basically what we are gonna be doing is uh, we're gonna keep keeping track of uh, the last used index and whenever we create a new element, we're just gonna assign it as the next available uh, unique ID. And it's you know f fairly straightforward, just a whole bunch of uh, boilerplate. Um, and then this is a syntax in, in Haskell. So rec means that uh, basically it's going to take the block inside of rec, and it's going to uh, transform it into this mfix form. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, you know, just like if you're familiar with say uh, ml. Um, then in ML there is a, in, or say, I guess scheme as well, uh, there is an, um, a construct called uh, let rec, which allows it to create like recursive uh, data structures, right? And basically this is kind of like a, the same idea, right? But it's just, uh, it tells GHG that the next block of code uh, may contain recursive references, in which case it's gonna do some special uh, transformations to it. Yes, and that's uh, very similar to what you have on, yeah, exactly. 
what, what's actually going to happen, right? You can see that this solution is actually composable. It's composable and it's, you know, safe. Um, it's referentially transparent because you're using a monad. However, it comes with a slight cost and verbosity, right? And also your, uh, I don't know, like your implementation of your data structures might have to change. And, the, you know, like you're writing things in the monad, which means that, uh, like, the way you're writing things is also going to change, right? Like, for example, over here, I had to essentially introduce a, an intermediate uh, node because I wanted to pass it to both of these parameters, right? Uh, whereas um, if I was writing in, in a more direct style, I would just pass, you know, like those uh, references directly. Um, all right. And so once you have that, and, and notice, let me explain how it's going to work exactly. What is the order of computation here, right? Well, first, you're, when you're like, computing this node, what's going to happen is that you're going to go into clock, right? At this point, you're already create sort of like a sunk, but it's not filled in yet. You go into clock. Here, once again, you create a sunk for L that references C, which is, or rather, you assign a value to L, and it takes C as a sort of like a sunk that is not yet computed, and then on the next line, it actually computes C, and so L is going to reference C, but it's, you know, and, uh, yeah. And so uh, this is kind of like crazy stuff here. Uh, and then at the end, you return the C. You know, and similarly here, right? It yes, it ties not in monadic computations. Yes, it ties no, not in monadic computations. And then, you know, here I wanted to uh, show you that you can, like, given this, um, given monad fix, you can also build a graph. Well, obviously, like once you have, once you've assigned integers to every single node, the rest is like, is just graph traversal and you have to compare nodes by ZID. Right? So fairly straightforward stuff. Um, however, what's interesting here, and I'm gonna see if I can explain it easily. Okay, so given a signal was integers as identifiers of nodes, I'm going to produce a, a graph. And you can see that this is basically, you know, like my, my graph representation uh, and mapping from IDs to those like layers containing uh, IDs again. And basically it's the same algorithm, right? I, 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 I get my identity of an element N, then I check if I've seen it before. Uh, if I haven't seen it before, then what do I do? What do, I do? Well, um, you can see that my state kernel uh, in, in this case consists of a map from, uh, it's basically the structure that I'm building is, is my state, right? But the problem here is that I want to first put an element into my map, uh, then traverse all children, right? Um, but the problem is that the element I'm putting into my map, I want it to contain the structure that I'm going to get after I traverse my children, uh, the children of that node, right? So you can see, like here, right, I'm putting, I'm inserting an entry that I'm going to compute on the next step, right? So this entry will be available only after I traverse my, uh, the children of that node. The reason I have to first put it in, into the map is because 
the children need to know that I've already seen that node, right? So basically I have like a uh, chicken and egg problem, right? In order to go over all of the children, they have to know that I visited this node, but in order to mark that node as visited, I need the final result of traversing all of the children, right? So that's uh, you know, one possible sort of a use case for uh, monad fix that is not uh, just building graphs. And it greatly simplifies this code because I don't need to keep like extra map or an extra set of uh, visited nodes. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Now, do you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, not to go away from monofix. So monofix, I didn't see this color, right? So what I saw is uh, structures like many is English monofix. Yes. Uh, if I want to get some slides, you know, something yes. already Yes, uh, I have. <laughs> I, <laughs> yes, but uh, I'm not. So I have a library uh, for properly lazy data structures called Lazy Boy, uh, and um, yeah, I have a lazy monad. And, and if you go through the whole process of like trying to build this, um, you know, recursive data structures and like lazy monadic computations, then you, you'll discover that this is this is the right. Uh, representation uh, of a lazy moment. You need both suspended pure and uh, you need a suspension in, in oh, you, I guess you don't need a suspension in flat map actually, but you need an M fix. Uh, well, it's uh, my own version, but it doesn't, it it's eval. Yes, yeah, so you can use eval from cats and that's going to be, yes. Uh, is it is it published as in published to Maven repository? No, but is it published as a uh, yes? <laughs> Sorry, it's just like uh, too many projects, too little time. Um, and then, yeah, you, you can actually like run this stuff. I don't know if I have any good examples. Probably, yeah, no. But. Uh, yeah, you, you can implement it <laughs> in Scala. You just you might not want to do that. Anyway, because it's going to be, uh, be, because like you will need to use this M fix and you will need to use it repeatedly throughout your code. Maybe you can come up with a better encoding, or uh, perhaps somebody could write a like a compiler plugin for Scala that ac actually uh, takes like recursive. Uh, basically, it would need to run um, before the type checker, I think, because or before the namer actually, because uh, that's going to check for forward references, and you need to make sure that they're actually, yeah, you, you actually need forward references for this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, right. Maybe a better monadic fork could uh, implement uh, recursive binds at some point in the future. <laughs> That would be really nice, but uh, until until then we are stuck with uh, either uh, observable sharing through um, like guarded referential equality, or just writing things. You know, just basically there are other solutions. They are just not as good. You know, none of them are quite as good. So the only two good solutions are either like this observable sharing, but it doesn't work in, if your compiler is too smart, or rather it works, but you have to make sure that your code is invariant to any sort of like duplication, deduplication. Uh, or you can use uh, monad fix, but that's only available in Haskell. No, I really just want to try yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, any any other questions? Uh, the slides. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna push them into the same repository. <laughs>
Any other? Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. So there is um, a couple papers about uh, observable sharing, but I think that the best one is uh, the most sort of like you know recent and uh, the ones that actually introduces this particular idea is called a type safe observable sharing in Haskell. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me add that as well. Any any other questions? No. Hmm? No. Uh, give me one moment. Let me uh, paper. Oops. Oh. Um, explain which part of Haskell? Uh, I was thinking about the four references, like you can work to create a separate zero one versus what's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, zero and y, y be one and followed by x, mm -hmm. and then uh, x we would get the second place. Yes. Mm -hmm. What makes those two pieces open to that? Oh. Yeah, that's, um, what is your like language of choice? Uh, Scala. Scala, okay. So, um, Basically, every data constructor in, uh, are you familiar with uh, type level cats? Uh, I mean, okay. Okay, well, let me see. I'm, I'm gonna bring up an implementation of uh, like the core component of it. Uh, I have it somewhere in the gist because this is a little bit, like I have it in, in this library, but uh, it's a little bit too, too crazy. Um, uh, give me one moment. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> So, and this is, basically, you have a thing called, uh, here I call it need, but um, in Haskell, it's, it's like on every single data constructor. So, you don't really, like, explicitly name those things, right? So, I guess you could also call it like lazy or sunk or like many different ways. But the idea is that you have a, Man, this could be a little bit too complicated. But basically, you have a var where the way the way uh, Sunks work is that, like under the hood, Haskell is full of mutability. Basically, every single value that you have is a sunk. A sunk is like a suspended computation. It's, it hasn't run yet. Um, and once you run it, you replace. Like, a sunk is more like a, either a reference to a computation that needs to be run or to the answer to that computation, right? Uh, and so whenever you force a sunk, it, it computes, um, you know, if it, if it is a reference to a computation, it computes that, computes that and replaces the, references, the reference with the, with the final value, right? So that's, that's like lazy, think of it as a lazy val in Scala, right? The only difference is that in Haskell, every single data constructor, unless you explicitly uh, prevent that, every single data constructor is like a lazy val. And those lazy vals live on the data constructors themselves rather than uh, like at the point where you define a, a variable, right? 
Okay. Now, so what happens when you write uh, a piece of code like, let's see. Actually, I might need that. Hmm. Let's see, like this. Okay, so what happens when you run this line? Well, first of all, you have alt. That's the outermost data constructor. So when you, when you run this line, the rest of everything inside of alt is not actually going to run yet. It's just going to produce a data constructor. Um, or rather, it's, it's going to produce like a sunk that when you force it, it's going to evaluate to alt first. And then if you force its contents, they're going evaluate to evaluate to list. And then when you force uh, you know, the second element of a list, it's going to evaluate to like a sunk again. Or rather, you first need to get to that second element, and then you are going to evaluate that second element. You're going to get a seek data constructor containing uh, something, like a list. It's, it's basically like, a, like you slowly, as you traverse this data structure, you're uh, sort of computing one layer, layer at a time, right? And when you get to number, what's going to happen is that this is a reference to an existing sun that you've already validated by that time, right? Because basically number is, an, uh, is like an alt of something, right? And so you've already validated that part, and so you already have a reference. So when you actually evaluate uh, number inside, it's actually going to just reference back. So, but the, the reason this, all of this works is essentially because under the hood there is mutability, and you cannot really implement uh, recursive stuff without mutability. Like if you uh, do let track in in F sharp, I'm actually not entirely sure how it works in F sharp specifically. But basically, how do, how do you make a self-referential structure? You first live, uh, you know. You, you build your object, but you don't fill one of the fields in. You like put a null instead of the, that one field. And then, at the next step, you fix all of those nulls, right? So that's, that's one way to, uh, to do that. Okay. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. and, and so in Scala, um, you can actually implement this stuff as well. Uh, as well. Um, I mean, this is a little bit more complicated than I would like to. Uh, I would like it to be, but uh, still, the idea is that uh, essentially, you know, like here, I have it's like lists contain inside of a lazy list inside contains a sunk that evaluates to its uh, like. Um, we had normal form, it's called. But basically, the idea is that um, once you evaluate this sunk, you're going to get something that is no longer a sunk, and it's an actual like data constructor, right? So, um, you, you sort of like every data constructor in Haskell is wrapped inside of this suspended sunk, right? Um, you, you can implement it in Scala. It's just yes. Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean, like in, in Scala, you can also do like lazy val. Um, <laughs> you, you can write lazy val x equals one uh, colon colon x, right? Obviously, gonna fail uh, because Scala is not a lazy language, and so when you uh, construct an object, when you do, uh, when you create a cons, when you use cons uh, data constructor. It's going to evaluate both arguments immediately, and so it's going to evaluate the tail immediately, which is uh, references the lazy val itself, and so things are going to break. Um, and actually, you're going to see a null pointer exception um, because 
that lazy val is not filled in at that point. Hmm? Or maybe stack overflow, yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but either one of those. Um, Uh, stream, yes, uh, so stream has a wrong kind of laziness, so that's why this library, uh, in the description, I say properly lazy data structures. Uh, stream is lazy only in the second parameter. And that is not very good, <laughs> let's just say. Yes. Yeah, and it, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's just not very, uh, it's, it's kind of like an ad hoc decision, I feel like. Whereas uh, the proper way to do it is just to like, oh, you define a type, make it lazy. Uh, Scala, Scala compiler, uh, no, I mean, uh, Haskell's uh, compiler is gonna, you know, first evaluate the second argument. It's gonna like store its value essentially, and then it's gonna, okay, see if it's true or false. And only then, if you, you know, in, in this particular case, it's not even going to evaluate x, a, x because it knows that if the second argument is false, I don't even need to evaluate it. I just need to return it back, right? Again, doing as little work as possible. So there is a lot of machinery, like, um, related to pattern matching going on in the background. And when you try to implement it yourself, you're going to run into um, a lot of pain, let's just say. Uh, there is a... Like pattern magic on like deeply recursive data structures is incredibly difficult uh, if, if they're lazy. It's just like um, I was trying to imp implement uh, red black binary trees in Scala using, you know, like basically implement them using a, like lazy red black uh, binary trees, right? And there is a function called balance which does a lot of deep pattern matching, basically two levels deep, or maybe it's three. Uh, no, two levels, levels deep, right? And it has like two separate arguments as well. Uh, you're like, I'm not entirely sure why. Anyway, maybe just one argument and uh, three levels deep, maybe. Anyway, my, my point is that if you try to implement it yourself, it, it's like, 500 lines of code. And it's just like a simple, and it's just 10 lines of code in Haskell. So that's that's the difference uh, in in complexity that you so you need laziness. You basically you need your language. You need native support for laziness. Otherwise, uh, you are so screwed. Any any other questions? Okay. Well, I guess uh, then we are done. Yeah.